I now call to order the society's 2,415th meeting in the 149th year since its founding, our March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, D.C., committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members and guests to tonight's lecture by George Ricker in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club here in Washington, D.C., including our members and guests around the world who are watching the live stream of tonight's video on PSW Science's YouTube channel. We will begin with a few announcements, followed by a reading of the minutes of the 2414th meeting and the lecture by Neil Deveraj on bottom-up synthetic biology. We will then turn to this evening's lecture, followed by a question and answer period. And when the Q&A is done, I will present a thank you gift to our speaker, make a few closing announcements, thank those who make PSW possible, and adjourn the meeting to the social hour. Please join me in thanking the sponsors of the 2019-2020 lecture series, the Policy Studies Organization, in cooperation with the American Public University and a very generous anonymous donor, who, being anonymous, is asked to remain anonymous. Please also, please also join me in thanking the sponsor of tonight's lecture, PSW member and longtime Naval Research Laboratory scientist, Bob Terry, who's here in the audience. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> he is unmistakable in his red blazer which I believe is an MIT blazer. So thank you very much, Bob. Please also join me in thanking one of the members of the general committee and the crew who keep this organization running and growing. The special thank you to PSW treasurer, Brett Magaran. <laughs> who's back there running camera number two. And he makes sure the bills get paid and the financial records are accurate and kept up to date. Spending is prudent, and reserve funds are wisely invested. He also does yeoman duty as second cameraman, a role in which he has distinguished himself by instigating the installation of the inverted hockey stick, allowing camera operators to sit while tracking the speaker. Thank you very much, Brett. And for those of you who are not familiar and may be watching these things on the web, and you may wonder why we have such long introductions. And the reason for that is because these recordings are not simply a recording of the lecture. They are the record of the society's meetings. And they include certain important announcements about society business. We kindly provide the time point at which lectures begin so that you can skip this if it doesn't interest you. But by way of explanation, because of the many comments we received on YouTube, I want to let you know that the recordings are actually the record of the society's meetings, not just of the lectures. I am pleased to announce that the following new members have been elected. Charlton Lewis II, a program manager at DARPA and an assistant professor interested in theoretical cosmology, quantum field theories, artificial intelligence, and defense science, who comes to PSW through the PSW Meetup Group. Stanley Rappaport, a physician and medical researcher, retired from NIH, but like many retired NIH researchers, still actually working there, who is interested in the brain and its metabolism, the blood-brain barrier, neuroimaging, the mechanism of action of mood stabilizers, 
and bipolar disorder and Alzheimer's disease who comes to PSW through the good offices of PSW member John Umha and tonight's speaker, George Ricker, whose background and interests will be clear to you in part from tonight's proceedings. Please join me in welcoming them to membership. There is a signed reprint of volume one of the PSW Bulletin for all new members. Please see me after the lecture to pick up your copy and read about why the organization was founded and who the founders were and what the original bylaws said. And if you purchase the PSW ribbon in conjunction with your membership, please see Cameo Lance who will be manning the ribbon table tonight. Recording Secretary James Heelan is away, so Special Projects Director Cameo Lance will now read the minutes James prepared of the 2414th meeting and the lecture by Neil Deverage on bottom-up synthetic biology delivered to the society and guests on October 18th, 219, right here in the Powell Auditorium. Cameo. On October 18th, 2019, in the John Wesley Powell Auditorium of the Cosmos Club in Washington, D.C., President Larry Milstein called to forth the 2414th meeting of the Society to Order at 8.02 p.m. He announced the order of business that the evening's lecture would be live streamed on the internet and welcomed new members to the society. The minutes of the previous meeting were then read and approved. President Milstein then introduced the speaker for the evening, Neil Deverage, professor in the Department of Chemistry for in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and a professor of bioengineering at the University of California, San Diego. His lecture was titled like life, bottom-up synthetic biology. Unicellular life first appeared approximately one billion years after Earth formed. Scientists have endeavored to explain how life arose from non-living matter. In other words, how chemistry became biology. Some scientists attempted to create synthetic life through a bottom-up approach. For example, and the Miller-Urey experiment showed that spark discharges in water and simple precursors could lead to amino acids, one of the building blocks of life. Conversely, other scientists have attempted a top-down approach, stripping down living cells to arrive at the minimal living cell. Deverage employs a bottom-up approach in his research, in part because it may result in synthetic or mimetic life different from current biology. Scientists have already created protein synthesis in artificial compartments. Deverage is now working to create the compartments themselves using phospholipids. Because lipids are bipolar, self, they self-assemble into bilayers, which can form into vesicles. Deverage discussed the various methods of phospholipid manipulation in his lab considered, including the remodeling pathway to create membrane-forming lipids. He then described in detail the chemical structures and reactions used in his research to remodel lipids to create membranes in water. In pursuit of optoapoiesis, whereby the membrane can create more of itself and potentially divide, Deverage's lab coupled a copper triazole species into their system to create an autocatalytic reaction that created both more catalyst and more phospholipids. Cross-reactivity is avoided by using a more common precursor and exposing the system to different precursors and environments has shed light on adaptation. This research is complemented by the top-down approach taken by Jeff Arrington in the United Kingdom, showing that bacteria stripped of their cytoskeletal machinery were still able to divide, driven by excess synthesis of lipids. Deverage is now experimenting with kinds of lipids identified in Arrington's research. Looking to the future, Deverage intends to explore chemical fuels and other energy sources in lieu of adding activated precursors, systems memory, evolution, and turning the system for homogeneity. Deverage is also researching the use of combining isolated biological parts to mimic life functions, to eventually attempt creating life itself. Postdoc Henrique Niederholmeyer 
is currently working to engineer non-living cells to mimic and communicate with one another to perform higher order function. To achieve this goal, the lab uses porous polymer cell mimics with a porous polymer shell and an interior of hydrogel in which DNA is entrapped. The cell mimics have successfully produced proteins, exchange proteins with one another, and specialized into protein senders and receivers. Devaraj said the, cap the capsules have achieved the higher order behavior of artificial quorum sensing, whereby they restrict gene expression in correlation with their density population. After the question and answer period, President Milstein thanked the speaker, made the usual housekeeping announcements, and invited guests to join the society. At 1014, President Milstein adjourned the meeting to the social hour. Temperature, 14 degrees Celsius. Weather, clear. Attendance in the Powell Auditorium, 87. Viewing through the live stream on the PSW Science YouTube channel, 30. Respectfully submitted on behalf of James Heelan. Recording Secretary. Thank you, Cameo. Are there any corrections or comments on the minutes? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion by a member to accept the minutes as read. And a second by any member. All members in favor of accepting the minutes? All members opposed? The minutes are this, thus unanimously approved and will be posted to the website in due course. We now turn to tonight's lecture on TESS's exoplanets results from the NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, George Ricker. George is the principal investigator for the Transiting Exoplanet Sky Survey Mission Tess, and director of the Detector Laboratory at the MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research. His observational and cosmological interests include studies of extrasolar planets and transient high energy sources. And his experimental interests are focused on developing new solid state photon detectors particularly silicon CCDs for space astronomy applications. In addition to seminal work developing CCD photon counting detectors for space, George also has pioneered the development of small, inexpensive satellites for astronomical missions. Previously, George was principal investigator for the International High Energy Transient Explorer the first satellite devoted entirely to the study of gamma ray bursts. He was principal investigator for the first photon counting CCD instrument ever flown in space, the CCD solid state imaging spectrometer on the Japan USA ASCA mission. He served as deputy principal investigator for the advanced CCD imaging spectrometer on the Chandra X-ray observatory as U.S. Principal Investigator for the X-ray Imaging Spectrometer CCD camera on the Japan U.S. Astro E-1 mission, and as the MIT Principal Investigator for the suite of silicon drift detectors for the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer, known as NICER. He is an author on more than 300 technical publications, and has met a great many invited lectures at professional conferences and in public fora. He has earned a BA in physics at MIT, an MS in astronomy in Yale, and a PS in physics at MIT. Please hold questions for the question and answer period at the end of the lecture, and join me in welcoming George to the podium. Thank you, Larry. Um, I hope everyone can hear me tonight. I've got a little bit of a cold, but I'll try to uh, articulate as, as clearly as I can. The uh, mission that I'm going to be describing to you tonight uh, is called TESS, and you've seen the uh, acronym and described in the way that uh, Larry put it forward. Uh, it's the result of uh, effort by a very large team of, of talented and dedicated uh, um, scientists and engineers uh, over the past five years, uh, 
of the group that's listed in the portion that you can see below. Let's see if I, this is running. Um, this this group down here, uh, this is a, um, a group that has put together something like uh, one to two million person hours uh, over this period of time to make this mission a success. So the, let's see if this works right. So this is a, a picture at what NASA calls the preliminary design review. And at this point, the mission really uh, began seriously in 2014 with a clear idea of what we were exactly going to be carrying out. And in fact, if I do this right, there are two of the members of this team uh, that are with us tonight. Uh, Jeffrey Vlosen, who served as the project manager, and, and uh, Matthew Ritzko, who were both uh, uh, with TESS all the way through this formative period and all the way uh, to the time of, of launch and initial operation. So they are, uh, in some sense, representatives of this large group of people that you see depicted here who are so important in making the mission a reality. The other people that I'd like to thank at the outset are other members of the Science Council and as well as some of the leaders um, in the data analysis and uh, reduction efforts that we had to do for tests. And the results that I'll be showing and sharing with you tonight are the uh, uh, results that these uh, this, that these folks have been able to, to provide uh, for the mission as a whole. So I'd like to begin, you know, I, this, this word transit was used uh, to uh, refer to what TESS actually does. A transit is used astronomically for a very specific uh, circumstance. It's a geometric condition in which um, a, uh, a satellite or a, or a planet actually passes in front of its host star and if I run this, uh, uh, this animation, you can see what this results in. If you're looking um, toward this system from some distance away uh, along the line of sight, you can actually see a shadow that passes uh, in, fr uh, uh, in, in front of the star from the, from the planet itself, and that causes a diminishment of, of the light. Now, in the case of a planet like uh, our Earth around the sun, that, that transit depth is really tiny. It's about uh, 85 parts per million. If it's a large planet like Jupiter, it's more like uh, uh, one, a 1% 1 diminishment. So there's a large range depending on the size of the planet. One of the key problems with making these types of observations is that they don't actually occur very often. Uh, typically, uh, if you watch for, uh, a star and look for a planet like this that would pass in front of it, only the, the actual transit duration is somewhere in the range of, of a percent at most to maybe uh, a part in a thousand. And so that means you have to be either very lucky or very persistent in order to detect something like this, this, this condition. But what you learn from this is a great deal. Uh, just from the shadowing of the planet passing in front of its host star, you can, you can determine that there are, are um, effects due to um, the, in the primary eclipse, when the planet actually passes in front of it, you can measure the size of the planet, and you can actually see the radiation that's transmitted through this little, ring, ring, this little blue ring around the planet, and you can actually uh, per, uh, determine the composition of the atmosphere from that, from that information that you would obtain. TESS doesn't actually do this, but this is the type of work that's done in follow-up. And then in the out-of-transit portion of the uh, of the observations that you make, you're going to be able to see uh, something more about the, uh, the atmosphere, but there's thermal phase curves that you actually get where the light will actually brighten or dim uh, as in the same way that the phases of the moon cause the, uh, a, a brightening and a dimming. And then finally, when it goes behind the planet, then you actually have a condition in which there's also a, sec a so-called secondary eclipse, and there's additional information on the physics that you can determine from that. So basically, the way that we configured TESS is we wanted to make sure that we could um, look for systems like this that are relatively close to our solar system. And then this primary goal, we wanted to be able to determine the brightest systems, and, and that actually means that we're looking for stars that are relatively close by, and then the effects that we're trying to observe in terms of the physical conditions um, are 
much more um, readily observable because you've got many more photons to work with. So that's, the, that's a key part. And the survey that we actually uh, determined that we were going to follow were to basically look at the solar neighborhood out to uh, about 200 light years and basically look at, look at every single star within that range to make these, these types of measurements. And so the other thing was that we were uh, required in the conditions that we were uh, 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 selected by NASA to do these all sky observations in only two years. And TESS is actually um, d dedicated to doing that. And as I'll describe to you as I go on, uh, some of the measurements that we've actually been able to make to, in the process of, of accomplishing this goal. So a brief history of TESS. The TESS is something that we, we were selected uh, to actually carry out the mission in 2013 and 2014, but there was a little bit of, of history before this. Um, one of the missions that Larry talked about was the HETI-2 satellite, which was nominally dedicated to um, making measurements of gamma ray bursts, but it also turned out that we had some star cameras on it that really worked quite well. They were able to, um, you know, we were, the, the people who actually made the instruments were scientists and we didn't really know what the minimum requirement was, so we, we overachieved a little bit and actually made instruments that, that had the capability of, of doing um, about a thousand parts per million stability. And so in the actual dedication, oops, I guess I lost the, um, can we start the, can we restart the uh, presentation? So, so basically in the, in the process of carrying out that, that, uh, um, that mission, we determined that we actually were able to determine transits for, for uh, a mission uh, that would involve looking at Jupiter-sized planets, but we wanted to do better, and that's what we ultimately turned to. So when the transit, when the uh, measurement starts, okay, there we go. That's right, 2A is the right one. Okay, so uh, if we go down to the that slide right there, that's good. And then press play, great. Okay, so the um, so basically, what we moved from that uh, mission, which was um, in 2006, we had realized that in the process of building that satellite and the instruments, that this could actually be done um, inexpensively enough that private funding from foundations and uh, and donors might actually be a way to carry out a similar mission. So we actually put together a privately funded concept in uh, 2006 um, and actually did get funding from organizations like Google and the Kavli Foundation to, to carry this out. But then 2008 came along and uh, there wasn't so much free money left in the system to, to go any further with it. So at that point, we started thinking about what could we do within the the range of, of uh, missions that NASA is actually able to fund in what, is, what are called the Small Explorer Program. There was an opportunity in 2008 for us to put forward a proposal for, for doing uh, tests, and we um, actually um, put together a proposal on relatively short, short notice. We had about two months before the deadline, and there were 40 proposals, and we came in seconds. So we felt pretty encouraged by this, and then finally, um, in 2011, we tried again, and we were successful this time, and that, that really was when TESS, as we know it, actually began. So the whole role that TESS actually plays within the scope of, uh, of NASA's programs is, is depicted in this uh, diagram. Uh, TESS is intermediate in terms of its, uh, its effort for uh, exploring uh, exoplanets uh, between uh, the Kepler mission, which was very successful, and the uh, forthcoming uh, James Webb and WFIRST uh, missions, which we're going to, going to carry out. TESS was actually launched uh, in April of last year, and then hopefully when Webb comes online in 2021, Webb will be able to do a lot of the follow-up work that's key to the scientific uh, um, product productivity that TESS is really capable of. So here's a picture of, of uh, of what Webb will look like. And the, one of the questions that TESS was really uh, designed to answer is where do you point Webb if you want to see transiting exoplanets and, and make the types of physical studies that I described in that earlier slide. 
and this is what TESS looks like. This is to scale, so it's a it's a very small satellite. It's a it's about the size. It's a it's about one and a half meters in height, and so you can see that, uh, like finder telescopes that amateur astronomers use all the, all the time, one of the advantages is, is that is that it can be small, but it has a wide field of view. It'll allow us to find the targets that you really want to study most extensively. So the way that this actually works out is um, the uh, the way that this diagram is laid out. Kepler had a search space that went out to about 3,000 light years. But in order to do that, it had to have um, a, a narrow field of view. And so it was, it was what astronomers called a deep, narrow search going out with, with, that would only cover about a quarter per, of a percent of the sky. It saw a lot of stars during this, this period, uh, during this, uh, this search, but um, many of them were uh, quite distant. TESS, on the other hand, um, is able to look only out to about 200 light years, but it has a, a so-called shallow wide uh, survey strategy. So then in terms of what this actually means, these are some of the numbers for the key parameters of the instruments that, that one would, would, uh, would consider in, in looking at the way that TESS and, and Kepler would be arranged uh, for the optical area and the fields of view. And the way astronomers refer to this product of these two terms is something called etendu. It basically is the grasp uh, that, a, that a telescope or a system can actually have, whereby you, you make a product of the optical area and the field of view, and that basically tells you the speed at which you can carry out a survey. And since we were, uh, it was important that we be able to survey the sky for tests in only two years, this was a key design parameter. But it also turns out, when you actually look at what these numbers mean, that and in the case of TESS, we made such a large field of view instrument that it actually has a larger Etendu than Kepler has. And in fact, it's the largest uh, Etendu system that's ever been flown in space. So to give you an idea of what this actually means in the, in the way in which uh, TESS is actually going to operate, I'm going to show you an animation. And in this animation, you're going to actually see the sky as it's, uh, as it's laid out. Uh, this is the the sun right here, and you're going to see successive rings uh, of uh, three light years, 10 light years, and so forth going out in terms of what you can actually see based on predictive models of what tests and other missions can actually see. So the color code is test will be predicted. There's some planets that have previously been discovered, and then, uh, or, or actually these are the ones that TESS has already discovered, and then there's some Kepler and non-Kepler planets as well. So if I start this animation running, you can see as you, you're out to about 10 light years, there's a few uh, orange dots. And I'll stop it here if I can. So here I am out around 100 light years. And you can see that almost all of what you're seeing are, are systems that TESS should discover. Um, this is the, there's only been one Kepler object. And this is consistent with what I was saying before. And if I let this run a little bit longer, whoops, let me go back. Um, OK. I'll just let it run all the way through at this point. But you can see, even out to distances of there's 100, there's 30 light years, and then this will be 100 light years, 200 light years. You can see, you can, you can see the picture that basically what we're detecting are, are primarily uh, the systems that, that are, that are going to be interesting. And then if you go let it run all the way through, you see that spray going off to the upper left, which are the, the Kepler determined planets. And then if you then say, okay, what does this mean in terms of what you can actually do? The, this plot shows the distance to the planets as a function of the planet radius. And the diameter of these circles is not the diameter of the planet, but it's basically how, um, how, how, how significant the transit is that you're actually looking at. And uh, then if you actually look at this a little bit closer, the the the, feet, the uh, objects that are in this portion of the of the parameter space that were discovered by Kepler are actually too faint to follow up. If you wanted to actually follow up these uh, these uh, the, the the targets that are in this portion, you'd need a telescope not six and a half meters the way Webb is, but more like 65 meters. It's which is larger than any any uh, telescopes that people have talked about uh, constructing even through the end of this century. And then if you let this go a little bit further, 
and you say, okay, the, these are those orange dots, those, those orange circles that you saw from uh, the test animation before. So this really is the sweet spot uh, in this region right here that we're, that we're, we're targeting with TESS. So as I said before, you know, the key thing in achieving what TESS can achieve is this enormous field of view, this 2,300 square degrees. This means that at any given time, we're looking at about 6% of the, of the whole sky. So this, this, is a, this is a key to how TESS can actually be successful. And to give you a feeling for, for what this actually means, this image that is, is being projected here is the result of one of only the, the, of, of the four uh, test cameras, each of which has a field of view of 24 degrees on a side. And if you compare this to other uh, missions, well, first of all, if you compare it to something that we can know of as a size, uh, the, the, uh, the, the moon itself um, has a has a, uh, a field of view, uh, is, is, it's about two-tenths of a square degree. So you could fit 10,000 moons within this field of view. And then if you say, okay, well, let's, what, else, what else can we compare to? This is the Kepler field of view. And then um, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, the LSST, uh, Steve Kahn gave a talk on this uh, about two or three years ago. Uh, this is the largest field of view uh, system that's currently uh, on the books for development by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. There's another instrument that's being built at Caltech, the, the uh, Suzuki Telescope uh, facility, Transient Facility, and it has a field of view like that. And then what, it, what TESS is actually doing is with this enormous 2,300 square degree field of view, we're getting a 30 minute exposure that basically tells you information on every single star, every single galaxy that's within that field. And that basically means that we're able to determine uh, information for um, uh, close to half a billion objects during the period of time that TESS will actually carry out its survey. So, and it does this in a way that you get 1,300 successive images um, uh, every month. And then you can actually make comparisons between those images, and that's the key information that, that TESS actually provides you with. So what this, uh, what this t turns into is that you can, you can view the, the test cameras not as imagers per se, but they're just exquisite photometers. And basically, uh, just in, in, a, in a more mundane sense, these are, these are like 64 million tiny light meters but that has a, have a precision of about 30 parts per million. So this is about 100 times better than what you can do with any ground-based system. So this is really the, the essence of the enormous grasp that TESS actually is able to provide in this large number of, of, uh, telescope, of, n number of objects that the, t that the telescopes will actually view. The number here, 300 million, are those that we can look at in two years with uh, a precision that's of the order of 1%. So the cameras themselves and the detectors are absolutely key to the success that TESS has actually been able to achieve. And these started out as um, uh, CCDs, charge couple devices, but these are different from the charge couple devices that you may have in your, 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 your uh, cell phones or, or, or even digital cameras that you have these days. They're, they're, first of all, the image that's shown here is a wafer from which the test uh, sensors were actually uh, extracted. The pixel sizes on these, uh, and each one of them has, a, has uh, uh, about four million pixels. These pixels themselves are about a million, or sorry, a hundred times larger in, in uh, their solid angle compared to what you have in your phone typically. These, were, these devices were fabricated at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory, and that was one of the key technologies that we had to develop for, for TESS itself. So this gives you an idea of what, the, um, what the, a flight array for a single camera would actually look like. Look, look like. The, 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 um, the dark areas in, this, in the center are the uh, actual imaging arrays, and the, the um, perimeter areas uh, where the one and the two and the three and the four are located, those are the uh, regions that the charge is actually moved to so that we don't actually have to have a shutter in the way that you think of as a normal camera. There's no moving parts. All the motion is done uh, on, a, 
on a uh, on an electronic level when the charge packets are actually moved from the imaging array. Then we may actually put one of these cameras together, um, and then uh, uh, and do and, and prepare for testing. And then in the testing phase, and this is something that we did in uh, in our laboratory at MIT, you then have a, a camera assembly, which is about seven or eight inches in in length, and then there's the camera, the, the actual focal plane area, which is down here, and then there's some supporting electronics that's back here. But you can see from the size of the uh, of the, the hands of the of the technicians that were working with this, these are these cameras are really small compared to what you're used to thinking of for telescopes that fly in space. So the other thing that we did with these uh, cameras is that we wanted to be able to uh, make observations of of uh, stars that are actually quite a bit cooler than, than the sun. The sun has a temperature of about 5,600 Kelvin, but that's the, the only, only something like three or four percent of the stars uh, in, the, in our galactic neighborhood are of that type. Um, if you take s stars that are slightly hotter than the sun, slightly cooler than the sun, that's maybe another 15 or 20 percent. But the remaining 80% are stars that are actually quite cool. They have temperatures that are in the range from 3,000 Kelvin to about 3,800 Kelvin. And as a result, those are the ones that uh, emit a lot of their light out in the infrared. So this plot actually shows way the, the um, spectral pass bands that you have for Kepler in gray and in, and in Tess in black. And the, the, the red trace actually shows the typical spectrum that we have from, the, from an M star, which is this type of star that's very prevalent uh, in our galaxy compared to the sun, which is the one that has the blue trace. So that was another thing that we did, is, is that we know that in, in our neighborhood, uh, something like 75 or 80 percent of the stars are of the type that are, that are indicated by this red trace, and so those we wanted to actually look at. The other advantage that looking at those stars have is those stars tend to be smaller than the sun, uh, somewhere in the range of, of uh, two or three tenths of the sun to maybe a half the, the diameter of the sun, and that makes the transits e uh, even easier to see. So, that, so then if I, I, I give you a little bit of an insight into how much the, uh, the, the cameras, um, uh, comp what the composition of the cameras are, that's what this diagram actually shows, the detector assembly, and then the optics itself, there are seven elements in the lens. But this is a camera that if you saw this without the lens hood, which is this, this final part, if you saw it at a, um, uh, you know, at a, at a basketball game or some, some sports photographer on the, on the sideline, uh, it's really consistent in that size. And the thing that's really amazing with these cameras is that if you continue to, if you, if you look at, at portions of the sky, uh, you can actually uh, detect objects that are a um, uh, uh, hundred million times fainter than what we can see with the naked eye. But, but this, is, this requires that you operate the cameras in space and that they be of exquisite quality um, and very low noise, which is the other thing that we uh, work very hard to make the cameras uh, operate as. There are four of these cameras and we staggered them this, uh, in, this, uh, in this appearance to get them in a, in a very compact uh, uh, configuration because at the time that we that we planned to launch tests, we thought we were going to be on a really tiny rocket, and so we had to compress everything together. And you'll see later on that we were actually relieved of that responsibility in, a, in an interesting way. So these are those four cameras, and the overall ensemble of all these is the 2,300 square degrees. So shortly um, before we we're getting ready to do our launch in 2018, and in late 2017, we actually started mounting the cameras uh, in this this configuration, and that effort continued into early 2018. So this plot, you can see there are three such cameras that are being um, uh, slowly uh, moved mo moved down and, and mounted in this uh, graphite composite structure before it, below it that will hold the cameras in very precise alignment one to the other. And then finally, uh, we got the, uh, the, sa the satellite, which is the portion uh, below this, uh, this line right here that I'm, I'm tracing across um, in, in place. This was at uh, um, Northrop Grumman Information Systems in uh, uh, Innovation Systems in, in Virginia, not, not too far from here, in Dulles. 
and then the, the uh, uh, solar panels are, are to either side. And this structure that you see at the top is a, uh, is a sunshade that basically uh, protected the this, this satellites from uh, the glare of the sun. So then we went down to uh, Cape Canaveral, where the launch was, was going to take place. Uh, we were assigned a, a Falcon 9 rocket for the, for the mission. And this is what the fairing actually looks like before a test goes in it. It's, kind of, it's a pretty amazingly large uh, fairing. And uh, this is what test looks like in comparison. So uh, Jeff and Matt and the, other, and the other folks on the team would often joke about this because saying, well, why, do we, why do we even uh, fold the solar panels? I mean, there's plenty of room. We could just have no deployables at all. So that was something that uh, we, we, we joked about. But ultimately, we just did it the standard way. So um, this is then a picture uh, as the satellite. This is the real, the real satellite right here um, with the fairing around it. You can get a, a, an impression of what it's like. And then um, uh, a couple of weeks after this, this image was taken, we went out to the launch pad. And on April 18th, uh, the rocket took off. Um, and uh, then about 40 minutes later, we had this image that came down through the telemetry. Uh, this is looking up along the second stage toward uh, TESS itself. And then it broke loose, or not bro break is not, a right, is not a right word, but it, came, it, it was deployed. From the uh, from the rocket, and then it drifted off. And then the next thing that happened is that we went through this rather carefully orchestrated um, deployment procedure that in, had inserted us in the orbit that TESS actually flies in. And the way that this actually works is that uh, after we were launched from Cape Canaveral and then somewhere over the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, the uh, um, the, the, the ejection took place in, in that image that you saw when, when we were actually leaving the rocket. And then there was a, um, uh, we were in a transfer orbit that went out about a third of the way to the moon. And then we gradually, we, we, we would then come back to the, uh, to the Earth and we, we went around. These orbits uh, lasted about, these tr so-called transfer orbits and, and uh, phasing orbits uh, act, uh, took about um, oh, 10 days or so to carry out. So then after, uh, after we, were, uh, we had completed this, this, this portion of the mission, we then arranged things so that we did a flyby of the moon. And the flyby of the moon accomplished two, 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 two things. It actually changed the tilt angle of the orbit. So and this, it's shown in this, in, this, um, in this image so that we would not be in the same plane as the Earth and the moon. And that meant that we would not have problems with the moon and the Earth coming through the field of view of the cameras. And then the other thing it did is that it, it, we actually stole some energy from the moon in order to, uh, to make the uh, launch a little bit uh, less energetic for, for what we had to do with propulsion. And so then after this was all over um, in something like a, like a month, then we, we, were, um, we were in the orbit that we actually needed to be, which took us from about 20 times the radius of the Earth out to almost the, uh, the orbit of the moon, which is about 60 times the radius of the Earth. So then that was uh, this situation that is, is shown in this diagram um, in which what, what you're seeing here is that we actually went into this orbit that's called a, a, um, uh, a lunar resonant orbit in which TESS's period in its orbit is half that of the moon. And if you arrange things this way, and this, this diagram actually shows this is the, the Earth, the Moon, and then TESS. And if I run the animation, what you see is that uh, it, uh, TESS is moving around the Earth um, twice as, as often as, the, um, as is the, um, the, the, the Moon itself. And then what happens is you get a configuration like this um, after a week from when I started that animation. And then what occurs is that, uh, actually, only a few days, because it's the, whole, the whole period around for the, from quadrature to quadrature is, 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 just, um, is just one week. What basically happens at this configuration is that the, um, the, the, the moon is tugging on TESS in its orbit. And in the, in the picture that you're seeing here, it actually, it, the, the, uh, the, the TESS is being pulled in this, in this direction here. 
Then if I let this animation run, a little, oh, so I gotta do that again, let's see, here we go. Um, basically, it, when, when you wait another uh, week after that first configuration that I'm showing here, then what happens is that, you, is that the configuration is repeated, only this time the, let's see, this is right here. Uh, basically what happens is that, uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the whole button down here. A um, little technical difficulty here. What, what happens is that you then find a, a place where uh, the geometry uh, from that first event is repeated, and then what happens is basically the moon is now tugging in this direction, is, is pulling tests in this direction. So those two motions actually balance out to first order. And then, and then the, the result of this is that this orbit is actually stable, at least in a, in a metastable way, on a time scale of the order of decades. Now this, was, this took a lot of computation, a lot of care, and, uh, and, and the work that was done by the orbital dynamics team to make sure that all the burns were timed properly were absolutely key to making this, wor this work. And, and then we were, when, we, when we finished this up, we, we, we arranged, a, we, we came to a condition where this, this axis uh, shows the, uh, the, the, the perigee of the orbit, the, the time when, the, when the, uh, uh, the location at which the, uh, the planet, the satellite was closest to the Earth, and then this is uh, years along here. And as you can see, this, this means that the orbit is sort of oscillating in this very slow, slow uh, period. Um, but uh, on a time scale uh, that's shown here of 25 years, that oscillation is limited. In, in amplitude, and it also means that the 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 uh, or, the orbital behavior that we get from this by basically doing this trick with the moon is such that we don't have to use any propellant or anything to stay in this uh, in this unique orbit. And the the real advantage that this has is that by being in this type of an of an orbit, we're able to carry out these extended uh, uh, observations. We're, we're getting 300 hours per orbit that are not blocked by the Earth or, 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 or great amounts of stray light. It's very stable. We're getting millikelvin per hour um, stability, and the stray light level's lower, and, and we're also outside of the Earth's radiation belts. And so all this is being done without the use of a propellant. And the fact that we're coming in relatively close to the Earth, um, only uh, about 20 Earth radii, means that uh, we're, we're, we're able to uh, uh, use telemetry rates that are very high for the existing um, uh, receiving stations on the Earth. Uh, for other orbits, uh, like the uh, lunar resident, or sorry, the, uh, the Earth-Moon um, uh, Lagrangian point systems, L2, which, is, which, is, which are the ones that are being used for a lot of satellites going forward, those have distances of the order of one and a half million kilometers. This has a distance uh, that we're talking about here of about 100,000 kilometers. So you square that number, so we have about the, uh, the ability in principle to use data rates that are about 200 times higher. So and then we uh, went into a period of time where we commissioned the satellite. This all took about three months uh, altogether. We, we achieved the, the required orbit. We established that the focus and stability of the cameras were really good. And then the attitude control system was quite extraordinary. We managed to get the stability of the satellite to, act, to be good to within one one thousandth of a pixel. And if you're trying to make very um, sensitive measurements of the uh, brightness of the objects, you can't have your instrument jittering around. So that was a key. That was another key thing that we were able to demonstrate during that period. So the, this was all completed by the, uh, tw the 24th of July. And then we began our science survey in uh, um, the day thereafter. And this actually, this animation I'm going to show you now shows exactly how that survey is carried out. So the, the so those four cameras uh, are offset in their in their directions, so that we 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 look at a stack of images that are 24 degrees by 96 degrees. And then basically what we do is every month we step the satellite around, and uh, after uh, a year. Uh, we did the southern hemisphere first, 
then we, we switch over and then do the northern hemisphere again, and that way we can satisfy this uh, requirement that we wanted to have of, of, a, of a duration of two years for the whole sky. And the other thing that, that we did by this is that we basically, you see these uh, little spots here and here, the southern ecliptic pole and the northern ecliptic pole, those areas we're looking at for almost an entire year. And those are the sweet spots for the Webb telescope. And, so, and that's one of the main things that we can do is, we, is that we can provide um, uh, targets for, spect for spectroscopic work for Webb that are actually located in the parts of the sky that are optimum for that mission. And for that matter, for other missions that are planned in the future for, for space, um, space telescopes. So then uh, we uh, achieved our first light image from TESS uh, at that period of time. And this is basically what it looked like. And I'll, I'll show you a few more images as we go through. This, is, this, is, this image is upside down because we're in the southern hemisphere. This is the camera that's closest to the pole, the one that we look at continuously. And then, there's a, then there are three other cameras that are closer to the ecliptic itself. And then these blow-ups that, that, uh, that I showed, um, let's see. Oops, no direction. Yeah. All right, that's, this is the back. Okay, the basically the uh, uh, these images here are blow-ups of each of those. This is the Large Magellanic Cloud, and then this one here, this little blob here, which is blown up here, is the Small Magellanic Cloud. These are these are satellite galaxies to the Milky Way, and many of the other objects that you see in this are well known. Um, bright um, first magnitude stars in many cases because Tess can look at objects that are that are in the range that we see quite comfortably with our naked eye vision. So anyway, this this uh, um, image then shows as we move around the sky how that all works out. So that's the first sector we had, and then we sweep around the sky, and these are the actual objects that uh, that, that we would be able to look at. And then then another thing is after we've done this. For a year, we can put together a montage of all the observed sectors. This is no longer simulated data. This is the real thing that we actually saw, and uh, this is the that's the uh, small ma that large Magellanic cloud here, small Magellanic cloud there. And then, if you look at each of these uh, areas, uh, you, it's in this image you can't tell, but if I blow it up, blow up areas, that's what the uh, large Magellanic cloud looks like. And then here's, a, here's an area of uniform star density showing how crisp the images that we get actually are. And here's another one. And then this is a, an image that shows what happens in the areas where the star fields are just so incredibly dense right in the, uh, right in the region of the, of the galactic plane. Okay, so then um, once we've accumulated this data, then the question is, well, okay, how, do, how does this get... Uh, uh, fed out to the community. TESS has adopted an open data policy, which means that within uh, as short a time as the team can, can reduce the data, we make it available to an archive at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And one of the things is that uh, in the first um, few days that the data was actually uh, made available, we actually had three million downloads from more than 500 unique uh, IP addresses, and there were something like 60 terabytes of data. And then over the over the last, and then the, the the community usage of this data has increased uh, many many times in the period of that first year. So at the uh, uh, most most recently, TESS is is distributing uh, about 10 times as much data as the Kepler and Hubble missions uh, were able to detect, ba mainly because. The, these, this image is, these images and this data that we're producing are exactly the sort of things that ground-based observers need to provide uh, follow-up and also uh, increasingly the use of follow-up uh, observations from uh, missions like, uh, like Hubble. And this follow-up observing program has been something that we've coordinated. There's more than 300 scientists and 100 institutions on six continents that are involved in the the, the uh, locations on the on this map, the blue ones are the are the uh, observatories that are doing um, photometry. Uh, imaging is being done at a wide variety, and the spectroscopy are the ones that are in color. 
And if I let this run, you'll see these are the number of candidates that we've actually been able to, to come up with and the number of spectroscopy and, and altogether um, there have been, we've, we've detected not only 160 previously known planets, but about 50 new planets that have masses out of the 1400 or so planet candidates that we've actually been seeing. So this is very much a work in progress for the test mission itself. And so this, is, this, this effort is still accelerating now only after, it's, after the uh, uh, little over a year that we've been operating the satellite. So there are many um, such results that are in preprint or are currently in press. I'm not going to go through all of them. These are some of the more recent papers, and it shows the kind of objects that we're actually able to see uh, in terms of the, the, the brightness and magnitudes and, and the distances. And many of these are multi-planet systems. And uh, certainly, if you're going to be thinking about places that uh, you want to send probes to in the next century or whatever, these are, these are the primary places to, that we're going to be looking at. So this is that, that uh, map that I showed you at the very beginning of, of uh, what TESS was expected to do. And here's a map of, of how, how far we've, we've gone so far. So we're, th this is, these are just the things that we're certain of, that we have, we've got masses for. There are many, many more objects, that, uh, uh, four or five times as many of these that are still in process. You can see how uh, how we're starting to fill in that, that region that we predicted we would be able to look at. And this this is a this is a a map that actually shows the publications trending uh, on tests uh, over the last uh, the last period of time. So the rate of publications is about um, a little a little under 200 per year, which is for or for a new mission. This is quite notable. The other thing is that uh, test itself is not just about exoplanets, because one of the things that we realized early on is that there would be a great deal of, t of time domain astrophysics that could be done with the full frame images. And these are just, these are where we thought, well, maybe there's gonna be some solar system objects that would be interesting. There might be um, explosive and, ex and, and variable extragalactic sources, and then a huge number of studies that can be done with variable stars. Because if you're able to, to see tr these very small uh, changes in brightness that are associated with exoplanet transits, you're certainly going to be able to see the kind of variations that the stars themselves uh, actually have. And so that was one of the other things that we knew would, would happen, but we didn't know exactly how it would happen. So, for example, in our own solar system, this is something that actually happened while we were still in the commissioning phase. Uh, we were looking uh, opposite the sun, uh, generally in the direction of Mars, just because that was an appropriate place for some of the commissioning studies that we could do. And we saw this, this, uh, this interesting uh, um, object here. We really didn't know what it was. It was, it was large, and it was, uh, um, this is a, just a portion of a field of view, but this thing was, was large and had this little trail. And it turns out that this was, uh, uh, was a, um, a comet that had just been discovered a couple of weeks before by the ne in the Neowise mission. And then there were other things that we started to see in this field. And if I blow this up, I think you can see what I'm talking about. This is, you can see that in this comet tail, over the, the 14 days that we're looking at it, uh, it's actually being changed by the solar wind in terms of its, of its direction. And then if you uh, see some of the stars actually blink, uh, the, that, that's because we're using a, uh, a subtractive filter to take out the average so the stars actually um, look uh, dimmer, they're, they're darker or brighter, and then and they're white in this representation. So then if you look a little bit more, you can see there's, there's other uh, factors from the fact that Mars, other features that are fact that Mars was so close by. But the thing that really uh, stands out, if you look a little bit further in this, is that especially if you move the images back and forth, you see these little things that are jumping back and forth in the, uh, in the image, especially when I run it a little faster than this. You can see, see, how that, see those, those little objects that are moving back and forth. Those are asteroids, and we're seeing tens of thousands of these. Um, in fact, uh, more than 100,000. These are largely known asteroids, but uh, in, as the mission goes on, the chances are we'll find, we'll find new ones as well. And the other thing is that since the instrument is as stable as it is, uh, we can basically uh, stack images for long periods of time, uh, several days. And because the, uh, because the only 
uh, source of light that we have uh, is the unresolved zodiacal light or, 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 or the light of many faint stars, that can largely be subtracted out. There's still some residual noise associated with it, but we can actually get down to, we can see this is a, um, uh, uh, Sedna is one of the trans, trans-Neptunian Neptunian, uh, objects, and there's several others, and the magnitudes that you're looking at here uh, go all the way down to 23rd magnitude. That's what I was saying before, is you know we're looking at objects that are 10 to the eighth times fainter than what you could see with the naked eye, and this is with, a, with, a, with an optic that's only about uh, four or five inches in diameter. And then one of the one of the neat ideas that is actually being uh, investigated right now by a team that's led by by Matt Holman uh, is uh, a search for Planet Nine. Planet. This is a, a prediction of where Planet Nine might be in a in a plot of uh, orbital radius versus mass. And this is where you think where we think it might be. That this is uh, this is the orbital distance of Neptune right here. So it's it's out beyond Neptune. Uh, this is a, a logarithmic plot along here, so it's a little, little hard to understand how that works. But basically, we, we have the tools to actually search for this object, and uh, that search is actually in, in, uh, in process now. And we should have some results in a couple of years. The other thing is, this is I was, I've told you about stars, and I've, and I've, and I've described what we can can uh, do within our solar system, but tests can actually uh, work out to extragalactic dis distances as well, because this 10 sigma sensitivity at, t at uh, 20th magnitude allows us to look at, um, uh, in, at time variable objects that are well beyond the limits of our own, our own uh, galaxy. So for example, this is a, uh, a plot that shows the characteristic time scale uh, along this axis uh, this is uh, so. This is a, uh, a tenth of a day going out to a day, or, and on, and so forth. And then this the the uh, energy scale along this axis is logarithmic, but it basically uh, runs from about ten to the thirty eighth um, out out to uh, ten to the forty sixth uh, ergs per second. And just to give you a reference point on this, the brightness of the sun is about ten to the thirty two uh, ergs per second. So basically, then if you say okay, what's going on in this region right here? The answer is no one really knows because those types of, uh, that, that area has not actually been searched uh, effectively by any of the other survey missions that have gone before tests. So if you say, okay, what, what, what might you see um, in this region? Well, uh, this is where the kilonovi, which are the, um, the objects that are associated with the LIGO-Virgo events are, are located. So we should be able to study that, those types of objects all the way out to the Coleman Cluster and beyond. And then uh, when you come into the Virgo Cluster, uh, these are objects that are gonna be somewhat uh, less luminous, but still they're, they're, they're very bright as, 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 uh, and very luminous as, as, as these things go. And then finally you can get to Andromeda, and then in the Magellanic Clouds, there's, always been, there, there's al already been an enormous number of, of discoveries that have occurred in uh, uh, in the Magellanic Clouds, the test is enabled because that because the large Magellanic Cloud is the region in the sky uh, when, in the Southern Survey where we're always looking at that at that particular patch. Another thing that we that we discovered is um, our supernovae. This is that same plot that I showed you earlier with the with the four cameras blown up along the side, and then what we actually did is if you if you look at this. Uh, there was a supernova that occurred in that, pa that patch of the sky. There's another one here, uh, and then there's another one, and so then they, the uh, and there, there's another one. So uh, all together, uh, the we've we've seen uh, 62 of these in the um, in the first year, and at the rate of discovery, it's going to be about 60 per year going forward. So this is an enormous amount of. Of, uh, of new information. And one of the things that you can see that TESS does very well is these are the light curves. So we actually see, this, see the uh, object before it, uh, it goes off and, and becomes a supernova. And then we can trace the light curve through this entire period, which is very important if you're trying to understand exactly the physics of what's going on. Another thing that we actually saw is something that's, that's truly incredible. It's, it's called a tidal disruption event. And it's a, a, a condition under which um, a rather 
unfortunate star happens to come within the tidal disruption uh, radius of a massive black hole. And in this case, th this is one that we uh, actually uh, saw uh, last year. And the, 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 that animation at the side shows the star being ripped apart. Uh, and then the, then the streams that fall, that fall around that are the residual material from the star itself. And about half of that mass ends up going into a, uh, into a ring like it's shown here, and there's about a, a half of it that's thrown off into parabolic orbits. Um, so this, this is something that had never been seen right at its inset, and yet here's, uh, here's, here's when Tess started to look at this particular uh, pl uh, place in the sky. There's the, there's the uh, Large Magellanic Cloud, and so it, so it was in the pole camera, and when we started making the, our observations in July, everything was just sort of bobbling along, not, not much happened. And then when uh, uh, in January of this year, basically what happened was boom, it went off. And, we, and, that's, and it was at this location shown by that little green dot. And we actually saw the climb from, from below detection all the way up to about 15th magnitude. And this is at a galaxy that's about 300, light year, 300 uh, million light years away, so it's about 115 megaparsecs. And what we were able to see is here's, the, here's a blow up of that plot. We actually saw, saw it at a quiescent level and then it actually started to rise in, in brightness. Uh, this was one of the theoretical fits that, that, had, that had been uh, one of the models that had been brought forward. It didn't follow that exactly and there's a lot of theoretical work now that's being uh, uh, carried out to try to understand the nature of this curve. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that uh, we're also thinking about what we're going to do with tests um, after the first two years because the anniversary is, uh, the first anniversary was um, uh, in July of 2019. We're going to also uh, be operating in the primary mission for, an for another year. But what about after, uh, after that time? The kind of things that we're going to be doing as far as exoplanets is that we're going to be looking for longer period planets because the longer that you look, the chances are greater that you're going to find planets that are further and further from their uh, their host uh, star, and that means that there's they depending on the type of, of uh, star that it is, they 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 might be in the habitable zone, and you can also expect to see multiple planet systems with seven, eight, who knows how many planets orbiting that host star, and we're going to be looking again at the stars that. Uh, the, the planets that we actually uh, saw in preparation for JWST. And there's a portion of the sky near the ecliptic. There was a band that many of you probably noticed that we weren't looking at. We're going to come and, and look, look at those, look at that m missing piece of the sky. So this is a, these are, I'm going to show you a, a succession of maps that actually show exactly how we're going to carry this out. Uh, th this is the first year where we went from sectors 1 through 13. There are 13 lunar months in a year, and that's why, uh, and, and TESS actually has a sector every lunar month so in terms of the way that it's, it's set up. Then we, then right now we're in uh, the, uh, the northern hemisphere for the, for the starting the uh, second year uh, of operation. So then we're gonna complete that. And then, and the blue, the blue patches actually show the portion of the sky that we would have seen. And then in the extended mission, we're going to uh, follow a slightly different strategy for sectors 27 through through um, 30, 39, and then uh, we, then we're going to basically clean up some uh, places in the northern hemisphere, including the uh, uh, a second look at the Kepler field here, and then we're we're going to then do do the ecliptic itself. So the combination of all these things together means that by the total mission we will have covered 97, 94 percent of the sky itself. So. This is the uh, the overall timeline that we have from the prime mission to the through this first extended mission, and if you think about what's going on in uh, other astronomical uh, facilities during this period of time, here's the test. the The pink area is the test primary mission and the first extended mission, and you can see that there are a number of new satellites that are coming into operation, or in, for which time domain astronomy will be very important. Erosita, which was just launched in July. Uh, a, a Swiss mission that's being done by uh, Switzerland and ESO called KEOPS that will be able to do 
follow-up work for um, exoplanets. Webb is going to launch during this period. Um, and then uh, LIGO and Virgo are becoming more and more sensitive, and that's going to be important because TESS can actually see the kilonovae events from neutron star, neutron star coalescences. And then finally, if we look even further out, we'll have good coverage for LSST. And then finally, uh, in, the, in, the, in this second extended mission, which if TESS gets it, we'll be able to overlap with some of these giant new ground-based telescopes that are going to be coming online. And then later on would be overlaps with uh, w First and Plato and other missions that are coming up. So the, the other thing, th this is sort of a summary of, of, of where we stand with the mission right now. One of the nice things that uh, has, has been very gratifying to the team is that we actually were, we were given the top science rate ranking for, by, by NASA in uh, a mid-2019 review, and that assured us by our being number one that we would continue on uh, for at least this first ex extension mission, which means that we'll be operating the satellite for at least another four years. So just um, as kind of a summing up uh, and looking ahead, once something that I've, I've thought about and our team has, has thought a little bit about is, well, what, what if we had another test satellite? What, what would we do and, and, and what would that allow us to do? And then if you had one other additional, I mean, you can ask the question, well, what, what if there were, were, were a third or a fourth? But just Let's just talk about the the, uh, the the one additional satellite, and that's what this animation is going to show in a minute. Is that the, there's the red, there's the green dot and the red dot. One is TESS, and the other one I, I call TESS Beast. And then if you let them go around, they they would they would follow the same orbit. But if you looked at the orbit from the side, one of the things that would happen is TESS right now has its apogee in the southern hemisphere, where you could you could achieve the same level of performance if you were to flip the orbit up by uh, the angle that's shown here, this enclosed angle, and that would give you a, um, a baseline for parallax uh, between the two. And if you did that, this, this plot, it's a little, little hard to read, shows you what you could do with uh, objects in the outer solar system in terms of making parallax, including what you'd expect for, for planet nine. So that would help that. And then the other question, the other thing is that you could do is, is since the satellites would op be operated independently, if you operated the two um, uh, in coincidence, so they were looking at the same patch of the sky, that give you twice the uh, solid angle, so that, so, so that sorry, you give the same solid angle but twice the area, or you could uh, offset them and then look um, at twice the solid angle at the same area. So these are all ways in which the missions could be operated, and then you know, if you go from two to three to four, then the numbers uh, increase correspondingly. So the goals that you might do with something like this are what are shown here. You certainly could, could do a much better job with extragalactic uh, transients and solar system objects I've talked about, and some of the other things that would build on from tests. But some of the new topics that you'd be able to do is you'd be able to do a really good job uh, looking at, at uh, diffuse extragalactic light. This is something that many people have actually uh, thought about, but it's very difficult to detect from the, from the ground. And then the other thing is this idea of, of techno signatures, so that if you actually had uh, satellites that, are, that had identical instruments and you looked at, at, a, uh, at, a, at an object and you saw a characteristic time signature, it could be that that uh, would, would be a clue as to something that might be a signature for a, another civilization and some technical um, uh, structure that it had put together. So that, that general term is, are, is being referred to as technosignatures, and there are many, many ideas for how something like this might work. And uh, you basically just have to go out and look at it, with look for something like this with the level of sensitivity that this type of emission would give. So these are some, this is some information on the type of operations that you could achieve um, and how it would actually be built. In terms of actually doing it, this is something that conceivably could be put forward as a low cost mission of opportunity from, uh, from uh, uh, with, with NASA's sponsorship or with other, other uh, sources as well. And it's certainly something that we're trying to look at with the idea that we might be able to get something like this on sky by 2024. So uh, I'd like to close with, with what I think is, a, is an interesting way to view what we've been doing with, with TESS. Um, Carl Sagan had a very, um, pro, a, a very prescient 
uh, view of, of uh, many of these ideas in a book called The Pale Blue Dot that was published in 1994. And the, the, the picture that he basically emerged is what's shown in this quote, which is basically when, when uh, the discovery missions uh, went, went from, uh, from Europe to the New World, uh, there was a lot of focus on what types of things were brought back, but the thing that really wasn't uh, given as much attention were the, was the, were the people who actually built these remarkably um, advanced uh, caravel ships at the time. And, the, and so the analogy that he draws, and I think it's very, it's, it's very interesting, is that spacecraft and the people who design them and build them and navigate it and control them, they're examples of science and engineering for, for our, our time that basically uh, set free for, for uh, peaceful purposes that really are uh, one of the, one of the, uh, the best uh, examples of the, of the quality that our civilization can bring forth. And, I, and with, those are the things that I think that missions like TESS, I think, um, are, are really important to think of as being you know, steps toward that idea. So thank you very much. The thing we do is more important. Peeling back the layers and reaching out into the universe. Just a personal opinion there. Okay, so we have time for some questions, and we have a procedure for questions. There are some mic runners with hopefully differentiated microphones. There are two red, is that orange and red? We have red, is that orange? And blue. And we're gonna go red, orange, blue, red, orange, blue, red, orange, blue, and I'm gonna call on you by the color. That's pink, Larry. That's what? Pink. Pink, oh, sorry, pink. Red, blue, pink, red, blue, pink, red, blue. So we'll start with the former head of, of uh, Air Force Research. Uh, I'm Frederica Derima and PSW member. Yeah, you have uh, to stand, you. tell us your name and whether you're a member and ask I, a question, no speeches. Uh, Save those I, for later. My name is Frederica Derima, I'm PSW member. I'm PSW member. Uh, thank you very much for your very nice presentation. Um, you uh, ended uh, by kind of saying the test base, uh, so which seems to be, since it's a replication, a uh, much smaller cost than the original, so it seems to me a great ROI. So what is the cost uh, and the percentage for the test base? And I have a second question regarding the, um, the tidal wave you said, the phenomenon. It seemed to me that this, um, you know, torus, it looks like a torus was created. So is this a kind of a self-sustaining plasma? Has anybody looked at it? That what we can add in a, in a sense achieve now with uh, all the SIVA and, you know, in terms of uh, sustain, self-sustained plasma, we maybe observed that there. Has anybody looked at that? Yeah. Um, the. I'll repeat the first question, and then, the, then yes. what I think you were asking is the second question. The second question, first question is, how much would test fees cost? Um, the second question was, for the tidal disruption event, what is the, uh, what, is, is it a torus, and what is the structure, and what happens to the light as it, as it goes on? Um, the, 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 the question about the cost, I think, is something that we're trying to figure out, um, and uh, the, uh, Jeff Belosa and I have had several discussions about this. I think if we, uh, if we use things like flight, flight spare parts and we uh, adopt the uh, less stringent uh, programmatics that are associated with these small mission of opportunities, that uh, we, could, we could actually bring it into that, that, uh, that range of, of cost. Um, to be more specific than that, I, I don't think we're in a position to to say any more than that right now. The, the, the question you ask about the TDEs is, is a very interesting question because um, the, 
uh, the, we know the energy scale because we know how far away it was. Uh, we can look at, at, we can do spectroscopy of the, of the hot gas that's left over. We can tell uh, what the temperature was and roughly, te uh, no, assuming that we know the mass of the star that was shredded in this event, we know what the gravitational binding energy was and, and how much was taken from it. Um, those, those numbers are, um, are astonishingly large. They're in the range of uh, close to 10 to the 50th uh, ergs per second. So they're even off the, sc off the scale of what I did, uh, I showed. And the, the actual cooling mechanisms that are associated with these, uh, that's what uh, the theoreticians who are working on this data now are actually trying to figure out because the, the, um, the, the roughly half the gas that's actually thrown out uh, in those waves that you saw going out, we can account for that, but the actual cooling time and whether there's self-absorption in the hot gas that's actually orbiting around the black hole, that's something that, we're, that, that, that uh, there's still work going on. Uh, hopefully we'll see other events like this with TESS and we'll be able to compare and contrast because they'll, they'll perhaps come from um, stars that are of different size or, or, or black holes that are, that are of different masses, and it's, and it's using that information that we can basically try to understand the physical conditions. Red microphone. Red microphone. Uh, Robert Thompson, I am a member. Um, a transiting event for, let's say, a, a small planet at least, results in a, a very small uh, fractional dimming of the right. of the intensity of this star. And I'm just wondering to what extent any natural variability in the intensity of the star confounds uh, that, the detection. That, that's, an, that's an excellent question. Uh, for a, a star like the sun, the variations that you see um, due to, to um, sunspots, for example, and th things that are called factorly as well, those, those variations are of the order of 30 parts per million. The thing that's, that helps you in, the, in terms of understanding uh, the information that you extract from that uh, rectangular shape of the actual transit, the, uh, for uh, an Earth-sized planet orbiting the sun, that period of time is about 11 hours. So many of those, uh, th those time variations that you see are, are on much longer or much shorter time scales. If they're flares, they're very short, and if they're variations due to changes in sunspot density, then they're very long. There are, there, it also turns out that stars vary a lot in terms of, of how much uh, vari variation that you actually see. Uh, there are stars that, um, uh, especially stars that, that are in the, uh, that, are, that are somewhat hotter than the sun, ironically, where the, the, the surface um, uh, layers in the sun are very, uh, of the star are very well mixed, and there are variations in those stars that instead of being um, 25 or 30 parts per million, they may only be two or three parts per million. So it just depends on the star in terms of how, 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 how well these measurements can be, can be carried out. But it's the, the other thing that I didn't spend a lot of time talking about is that you also have to take into account how we determine the masses of the planets because the only thing that you get from transits, or not the only thing, but the main thing that you get from the transits is you actually get the, the ratio of the, uh, of the projected area uh, of the planet compared to the area of its host star. Um, so that tells, you, um, that, that tells you basically, if you assume the, the planet is spherical, the, that tells you basically the volume. And if you then, uh, but in order to determine the mass, that, the best method that we currently have for that, there are two other methods, but this is the best one, is the tugging back and forth that you get uh, from the reflex motion um, of the of the planet actually moving the, the moving its host star, and the, um, the 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 those are really tiny motions. Uh, for example, the Earth uh, ro ro rotating around the uh, the sun. Uh, if if we were looking back, look at our looking at our system from outside the solar system along the plane of, of, our, of the ecliptic, you, that, that relative motion would only be about 10 centimeters per second. Um, if you've got a more massive system, a more massive planet or, or a, le a less massive star, those numbers can go up to of the order of a meter per second. So that's the range that you actually have to work with. And those period, the periods associated with that sinusoidal motion is the orbital period itself. 
So if it's if it's a week, then that then that, that oscillation takes about a week to take to, to occur. And so you have to have an instrument that is extremely stable over that long a period of time in order to make those measurements. So that's one of the things that's involved in the follow-up program. And the people that we're working with in that area have built these un unbelievably stable ground-based spectrographs that can actually make these types of measurements. Blue. I'm sorry, blue microphone. Hi, uh, Carl Merrill, I'm a member. Um, I have three questions, but they're based on the spectrum. One you is the- You only get two. That's, <laughs> they're, they're related. Uh, one of them is this presumably can extend the range of objects that was studied in the Gleesey survey as to the movement in relationship yes. to our solar system. Right. Yes. So the next question is that recently it was announced because of spectral changes again that, um, that they may have detected a small black hole about three times the mass of the sun rotating around another star. Was that done by TESS or can TESS do that type of thing? TESS can actually make those uh, types of measurements. And in that, in that particular instance, the system was, was uh, beyond the faint limit that TESS could have. But the, an, an idea, another idea that we're actually uh, looking through the TESS data to try to find is that it's quite possible that uh, there are, we know of at least one system where, there, where there's a white dwarf that has a, which is a, a roughly an Earth-sized star that has um, uh, planets orbiting around it. Um, that's not been determined by transit, but TESS could in fact find transit systems like that. The other type of system that you're talking about would be one in which you could actually have a, a small, a low mass black hole that would actually be rotating around a normal star. And if you see something like that, you'll see a very funny light curve where it'll be, it'll be, uh, uh, there'll be a, a, a diminishment in light that looks like a transit, but it's going to have really peculiar looking wings uh, on either the um, ingress or the egress side that are actually due to the gravitational lensing that occurs when the sun when the sun's light comes around. We're we're looking for those things. We haven't found any yet, but we're we're certainly. And the final them. question, again along the same lines, is there was a recent paper that postulated that Planet Nine might in fact be a black hole about uh, nine or so times the mass of the of the Earth, but that that would be uh, the event horizon would be about the size of a baseball. So I, I don't know whether you could detect or whether there's any chance of detecting something like that. Well, the, the effect that we would we would actually, if it didn't emit uh, light uh, brighter than 23rd magnitude, we certainly couldn't see it. But um, the the ideas that are that are most commonly expressed, and you know, Tess is going to be able to search that, would be if it is a uh, a reflective body. Uh, that is uh, like a like a, uh, a so-called super Earth, uh, and there is evidence for this from some of the the chain for some from sort of the uh, the orbital inclinations that are seen for other trans uh, Neptunian objects that are that we do know of, and that's why there's so much uh, uh, interest in trying to find this object because that's uh, it 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 looks like. Um, uh, what we call um, super Earths, which are uh, planets that have masses that are about one and a half or two times that of the Earth. Um, they're, they're actually the most common planet um, in our region of the galaxy, but we don't have one in the solar system, but maybe we do. I think we'll go to the black microphone. Is the pink microphone still around? So we're going to go to the black one, then we're going to go to the pink one, then we're going to go to the red one, then we're going to go to the blue one. Uh, Bob Jerry, member, uh, is TEST able to look at things in other galaxies? Oh, yes. Yeah. So you might also look at Cepheid variable stars and redo some of those surveys, perhaps get better distances? Um, you, you possibly could. Uh, the, the thing that's um, a lot of those, if, since you, if you know, once you, once you know that it's a Cepheid variable with the time scale of, the, of those variations, TEST could certainly... Uh, look at things like that, I, whether it would be able to discover new ones or not, that's something that probably is in the data. I don't think with the level of sensitivity that we have that you can probably get out much beyond the Magellanic Clouds. But, but as you say, that's an important step in the, um, in the cosmic ladder. But that things of that. tests like structures which are larger could possibly reach deeper. I mean, uh, yes, that's bigger. possible. But, you, uh, but again, 
you've got this trade-off to worry about between solid angle and, uh, uh, and aperture size. TESS is, uh, is an F1.4 system. Um, by, if you had two TESSs together, that would be an, uh, the equivalent of an F1 system, so you get down to about F.6, but go, getting much further than that, uh, with a, getting to that level with a large aperture optic is extremely challenging. Uh, there, there, are no, there, 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 there are no designs that I've ever heard of that can actually get you to, down to something like F.5 with a uh, multimeter uh, telescope. Astronomers, astronomers have been is, wanting to do this for a long time. Pink microphone, pink microphone. <laughs> uh, yes, hello, Charlton Lewis, a uh, new member. Uh, I got a fairly simple question. Um, what was the rhyme and reason for the direction of which the, uh, I guess you think you, you called it the sweet spot or the northern and uh, southern uh, ecliptic poles? It looks like for the southern one, you're staring at a uh, Magellanic cloud. Was there any particular feature you're staring at um, northern looking? Um, well, that that was that that was two. There were two reasons be, behind doing this. One is that te, uh, test was designed so that it would look at the at the part of the sky that that passes through the meridian at midnight for ground-based observers. That was one thing. The other thing was that we we were limited by the number of cameras that we could actually put together, so that we couldn't actually cover an entire. Uh, 180 degree field of view uh, north south. Um, Je Jeff and I talked about that at one point, but but he but he was the the voice four of reason four saying cameras th was enough. that's right. <laughs> he said four cameras was four enough. cameras was what we had. So one of the things that so, so then the the other uh, the other part of your question is what is that what's the nature of that sweet spot? Um, that sweet spot is actually a uh, has significance for all of the missions that are being planned by NASA, the European Space Agency, and many others in the, in the future. Because if you're actually, if, if you just, just think about the fact that you're um, you're you're out in uh, in space at at L, at L2 or even in a, a, some sort of a drift away orbit, one of the things that you're always going to have to do is you're going to need to to have a side of the satellite facing the sun in order to get solar power. And then if you if you if you've got that constraint and you're actually moving and, and you're moving around the sun with a with an orbital period of order a year, two years, whatever you choose, then that automatically defines a location in the sky that you can always look at. And that that location is the is the either either the north ecliptic pole or the south ecliptic pole. And so that's why those two 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 locations have special significance. The practical issue is that that is also uh, a region, you, you can also look around uh, in a great circle around, around that location, but you can only do it at certain times of the year. So the, the other thing is that we knew that Webb was going to need targets that it could look at at any time. And as, as I mentioned at one point, uh, these transits don't occur very often. They're only a, a, a percent or if you, if you just stare at a given star, and you don't really know whether there's a planet around it, you might have to, uh, to look for a thousand days and that transit might only occur in one day of that period. So, so, it, so you really wanna know when the transit is occurring and you also want to know that it's occurring at a time that telescopes can look at it from, from space. And so that was why we chose that spot. The fact that the Large Magellanic Cloud happens to be near the, um, the south ecliptic pole is sort of an accident. It's a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, and uh, it's, it's orbiting around the Milky Way, and it's just that the time in which we live, it just happens to be there. So we're happy to see it. <laughs> Red microphone. Thank you. Uh, my name's Lisa, not yet a member, but I plan to join. Excellent. <laughs> technology transfer question for you. So I work in medical imaging science and also do photography. So I look at this in lust after new gear. So yeah. what kinds of technologies, what new things have you done here with the cameras that we might see maybe in the coming near future for professional and even amateur photography? Well, I, I think the, uh, the, the, the the technology associated with the detectors is, is one of the most unique things that came out of TESS. 
And it, it, and it isn't just the size of the array, that's certainly something that's large, but it's also the way we were able to mosaic the detectors together. But the other thing that we did, and this was the first time that a, de a detector of this quality had been uh, put together, was the, the actual uh, interaction depth of, the C of, of our CCDs is 100 microns. If you take the typical CCDs that are used for, for uh, uh, commercial digital cameras or whatever, their, their uh, depletion depths are the order of, of five or 10 microns. So the test CCDs are 10 or 20 times as deep. That means you can extend the coverage all the way out to the infrared because um, the infrared uh, uh, trans tr uh, uh, opacity of the, of the detector is not very large unless you get out to of the order of, a, of 100 microns. The other thing that we had to do, and this is something that I think will, will also be uh, really important going forward, is these are absolutely the best CCDs that have ever been made. The, the, the cosmetic quality, the uniformity of each pixel, because we knew that we were looking for uh, performance at a, one part in 10 to the fifth was, was what we were, were, were aiming for. And, they, and you only get that if the detectors themselves are made of, ex, of a really exquisite material and all the processing steps that are involved um, don't degrade the quality of the material. And you, can, and you can also understand what defects there really are there. So in terms of, of how this would affect something like medical imaging, I think there is, there, there is work like this that will be uh, undoubtedly done in the future. But these, these devices were very expensive because they were the first time through. And of course, um, you know, Moore's Law and all the things that, that follows from that, these things will certainly become cheaper in the, in the future if there is a need for these things for other applications. Okay, blue microphone. Would you please stand up, tell us your name if you're a member, and ask a question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alon Lanier. I'm not a member, but I plan on being one. And uh, basically, I just have two questions about, about space. Uh, but just exp this whole field in general, not necessarily about tests. Um, first of all, the development of adaptive optics. Since, since they, those made a ground-based observation just as efficient as space-based telescopes, are we going to need to keep on sending telescopes into space in the future? And second, regarding searching for exoplanets, if we're looking for Earth-sized planets, are we getting close to develop a coronagraph that has the optical stability level necessary to observe an Earth-sized planet? Are we coming close to that, or we're still far away from it? Okay, okay. well, in terms of um, your, uh, your second question first, the, um, the, there, is a, there is a coronagraph that's planned to fly on the WFIRST mission as a, as a demonstration uh, uh, instrument. Uh, it, it is, it's not, initially it will not have the capability to, to look for Earth-sized planets, but that would be something that it would be moving toward in the future. Your question, so that, so the, the answer to that is, um, it's something that, that is, um, there's, there's a lot of work being done over the next 10 or 20 years, uh, there, the technology will probably be much better than it is right now. That's also being driven not just for space use, but it's also being uh, used for ground-based work as well. The question that you're asking about adaptive optics is, is an interesting one because um, you can do absolutely amazing things with adaptive op optics. You can get sub-arc second, you can get down to diffraction limits for telescopes that are of the order of 10 meters or so in size. But it turns out, and this is an important but, the piece of the sky that you get that exquisite resolution in might only be a, 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 an arc minute or a fraction of an arc minute. So then if, you tr if you're ever trying to do something that involves uh, building an, a high Itandu instrument or, or, so, or some way that you can survey the entire sky, you've got to go to space because that's the, that's the only place that you can uh, achieve those kinds of goals. If Bob will allow me, I'm gonna ask a couple of questions. Would that be okay, Bob? Thank you. My first question has to do with your, in, uh, the, the manufacturer of the CCDs. What, how many did you reject? Did you do a lot of, because I know on this digital Sloan Sky Survey, they, right. they really culled uh, the, really the perfect ones from a large uh, run of manufacturing. Well, we were, 
we were aware of a lot of the problems that people had had with uh, yields of such devices like this. Um, and one of the things that we did is we, uh, at the very beginning of the program, and this is something that Jeff and Matt were very helpful in, is we said, look, we're gonna, t we're gonna scrape m as many of the dollars as we can in the program and make sure we start early on that, uh, that project. And we, and we also uh, fabricate as many devices as we think we, we can get. One of, the, one, of the, one of the really wonderful surprises is that we had very good yields Wow. And so we, uh, all of the devices that we fly are, are, are as close to cosmetically perfect as, as, as can be the case. Um, in terms of, uh, um, and, and we actually have devices that, um, that are residuals from that that are also of very good quality. That's one of the reasons when I talk about test two, three, four, I, I know we've got some of those things in our back pocket. So, that was my second question, yeah. which was what kind of improvements did you think you might be able to incorporate into test two at the level of the CCD detectors, photon counting. I don't think we would. We need to improve on the on the CCDs at all because the, the the quality of the electronics and the detectors. The main thing that we're we're obtaining by doing that is that um, if you if you look at the same portion of the sky uh, with tests and 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 something that's pretty much a test twin, one of the things that you can do is uh, there are um, if there are uh, events that occur that are non that are not due to the stars that you're looking at, there are things like cosmic ray events. There right. are occasional um, uh, glitches in the electronics or whatever. But if you if you've got two satellites that are tens of thousands of kilometers apart, those things are uncorrelated. So that means that you have the confidence, if you have measurements like that, that if you see something and you see it in both of them and it has the same level it's of real. intensity, then you know it's real. And the other thing that you can also, we can also do is we learned a lot from tests in terms of the, the electronics, uh, the technology for use of, uh, of high-speed data transmission um, through uh, K-band or even uh, using things like laser links. Those things are going are gonna to occur over the next few years, and, and you can incorporate those types of new technologies uh, as, as you would build more of these satellites. Thanks, thank you. Uh, Bob, go ahead with your question. I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a member. Yes. Uh, what are the plans for coordinating TESS with the James Webb Space Telescope? Well, the main thing that TESS is doing to, uh, to coordinate with Webb is doing its homework and, and providing the objects before uh, Webb can actually fly. That's, that's the main thing that it's doing. As far as uh, um, the, the discovery process that we actually will, will have where we're continuing to find more attractive objects, that's certainly something that the, that the people um, uh, on the Webb team are gonna be aware of, but more to the point, uh, the test data is public and so therefore in any near-term and far-term planning, that, that database is essential for the types of work that, te that uh, will be done with, uh, with web uh, for exoplanets. I think there's a black microphone somewhere? Yes. Okay, oh, you. Adam Hi. Jacobson, I'm a member. You mentioned that the full-frame images that TESS is taking are 30 minute to an hour exposures. Is there any sort of blurring effect from the movement of TESS in its orbit during these individual exposures, and if so, how do you correct for that? Yeah, well, uh, yes, the, the actual, uh, there, there, currently there are two types of exposures that we use. We've got two minute exposures and 30 minute exposures. The two minute exposures uh, require a lot of, uh, of data to, that has to be stored on its on, onboard recorder, so there's a, there's a relatively limited number of those that we can, we can look at about, uh, Two or, two or three hundred thousand stars, but we, we, we actually target those specific stars. With the, um, with the full frame images, which right now are 30 minutes, uh, those, uh, those are, um, th they take whatever objects that are, that are in the field, you don't have to do any pre-selection or whatever. In the extended mission, we're actually going to reduce that, um, that uh, integration time down to 10 minutes, and then we, we can continue to stack those Three, three together will, would be equivalent to what we would have for a current 30 minute. But in reality, we can, from many of those images that, uh, that you're going to see from, from tests in the future, they may result from the data being stacked um, 
uh, 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 as, as many as um, one or two days worth of, worth of data. So it might be 48 or, or 100 images, basically, that you're putting together. The, the, the question of how does the data quality change within one 30-minute exposure, there's, a, um, there's an effect called uh, velocity aberration. This is the fact that the speed of light is finite. Um, and, and then there's also the fact that um, it's, it's like if you're uh, on, a, on a bike riding through the rain. The rain doesn't, even if the rain is coming vertically, it doesn't actually seem to you to be coming vertically. It's, it's shifted over an angle. And then one of the things that happens with tests is with this differential velocity uh, aberration, the photons that you're, that you're getting, that you're looking at, um, change their, their direction depending on where the, their apparent direction, depending on where you're looking in the field of, of view. This is a special relativity effect. And we, we, we can calculate exactly what those effects are and correct for them. Um, and we, so we, we, uh, this is something that we, we know, since we know where the stars actually are, there's this wonderful mission that the Europeans flew that many, many people probably know about called Gaia. Gaia basically has told us where the billion brightest stars in the sky are. So for all the work that we're doing um, on exoplanet surveys, we're absolutely uh, guaranteed that those stars actually are in the Gaia catalog. <clears throat> and the thing that they do, that they did so very well, is they have actually determined the locations of those stars to uh, tens of micro arc seconds. So we know where those stars are supposed to be, uh, in a um, in a uh, in a in a in an inertial frame, and then if we take into account TESS's motion in its orbit, as well as the orb the motion of the Earth around this the Sun in its orbit, we can we can make those corrections, and that's what basically what we do. So they, if you don't correct for those, there's a slight smearing, but we know what that smearing actually is. Last two questions. Blue microphone first, and then the pink microphone for the man from Oklahoma. And we're very happy to be ending our question and answer period in the middle of the country, <laughs> sort of. Hi there, um, my name is Gabriel. I'm wondering, uh, or I'm hoping to be a future member, I should add. Um, I'm wondering about the work of John Godrick specifically who um, identified some uh, transit related events in the past. Um, but there was uh, work finding certain demon stars. And I know uh, in the past, uh, Godric did find, uh, to some acclaim, uh, with a little bit of input from Tess, I believe, um, some interesting events that led to questions about the protocol if, as we're exploring new parts of the galaxy, as we're exploring some of these new uh, exoplanets that potentially we might find instances of extraterrestrial life and what our response uh, would look like. Um, I, I'm not familiar, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd appreciate knowing exactly the reference that you're referring to because it isn't something that, that I'm actually familiar with, but the, um, uh, the, there are many people who are using the test data in addition to the, to the, uh, the group that's doing the follow-up program. There's um, at least five very well-organized amateur groups worldwide that, that we know of, and I'm sure there are many more, and, the, and, and those people are publishing data all the time from the test images, and, and a lot of it is superb work, and it's one of the ways that we've been really pleased with the way that uh, TESS has brought both the amateur and the professional astronomy community together. Okay, last question from Thank you. the pink microphone. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I was fascinated you, by oh, your... Oh, oh Herb Abramson uh, from Oklahoma. <laughs> are, you a are you a member? Uh, I was fascinated by your mention of the uh, ninth planet, that uh, what I've been reading and studying is that some people are also calling it, I don't know if you ever heard of the term Nibiru? No, uh, I haven't. Okay. Sorry. Uh -uh. It, it's just an anachronism for uh -huh. the ninth planet. Uh -huh. That... We haven't been able to, with the observatories on the Earth, as you're talking about like what TESS is doing, to see it because it stayed below our horizon. It's been so far out in the galaxy and the way it makes it tr its transit around, 
The Earth, we haven't been able to view until recently. I read in Australia, they spotted what they believe to be possibly the ninth planet. And what they claim is that the trajectory of the ninth planet is going to bring it relatively close to the Earth. And what I'm curious, if you have any knowledge of, that when it comes close to the Earth, because it is much larger than the size of the Earth, that it would, could cause a possible di disruption in the Earth's magna and in the poles, in the magnetic poles, that they're speculating the reason they have seen it recently is because it's getting close enough to us that we finally can see it above the Earth's horizon. So I was just curious what your thoughts well, are on that. Well, I, I, I'm not actually familiar with that work, but, I, but there's some, there's some, there are two important numbers that should be taken into account when you talk, start thinking about uh, Planet Nine. Uh, the limits on Planet Nine's distance from the sun, it's somewhere in the range of 200 to 400 astronomical units. So it's 200 to 400 times the, uh, the, the distance that, that the Earth is from the sun. Um, if you then take that information and use Kepler's laws, uh, that means the orbital period for it is around 8,000 years. And if it's around 8,000 years and it's in an eccentric orbit, especially, the vast majority of its time it's going to spend out near, uh, now, out, out near uh, aphelion and not close in. So uh, if something like that has been discovered and it really is at that distance, um, I, d I doubt seriously that we have anything to worry about. I have to add a comment here on behalf of Alan Stern and Kirby Runyon, PSW members, I protest the use of the name Planet Nine. We already have a Planet Nine. <laughs> and, and its name is Pluto, and this is Planet X, or 10. Thank you very much. OK. <laughs> I'll, was... I'll, I'll, I'll let that go. <laughs> Any of you who are interested in the merits of this, you can watch our PSW video and see the debate between Alan Stern and Ron Eckers on the very subject of, yeah. is Pluto a planet or not? And if it is, how many planets are there? Well, I think the only reason that I would, I would say in defense of Planet Nine in this idea is that it, by all of the standards that people had, had uh, uh, advocated for uh, why Pluto should not be considered a planet, this planet would have those characteristics. Oh, so that's, I would dispute that because you don't know its orbit, and if you don't know no, its no, orbit... No, we, we actually do, we do, we, we, but that, 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 that triangle... <laughs> I stand corrected. Yeah, the, Let, the, let's that leave triangular this the area that I, that I showed is where we, if, if such a planet exists, it has to be in that, in that range, and that means that it would have a mass uh, larger than... Um, than, than the Earth uh, or Venus or Mars, so it clearly would be in the range uh, that we would call it a planet. But I, but I'm not I'm not going to go. We'll make for another debate. interesting debate between Alan yeah. Stern and whoever advocates that there's a sure. planet X out there, or I'm sorry, planet nine or nine X X nine. All right, thank you, George. Sure. <laughs> thank you. Before you go. We'd like to thank you for uh, spending this time with us. And you're right, you can get rid of your microphone. I would like to present you with these, these two small gifts. Uh, one is a copy, uh, a framed copy of the announcement of your talk, signed by all of the members of the general committee on behalf of all of our members. And also a signed copy of bulletin Volume one of the Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington. Um, all new members should actually get a copy and read it, at least the first 18 or 20 pages, because it lays out the reasons the society was founded and who the original members were. And you'll be very interested to see all the other organizations that they went on to found, including the Cosmos Club and the National Geographic Society, the Washington Academy of Sciences, and numerous other organizations. But thank you so much for coming and for the splendid talk. Before we go, no, just, just go, go, go. No, take that with you. She's going to take you to the back. George is going to go to the back where he's going to get some refreshments and catch a breather. But before he, before we go, 
Ah. Uh, PSW depends on members and sponsors, like Bob Terry. If you are a member, please note the 2019-2020 dues notices have been sent. And if you have not yet paid your dues, please pay. And please consider making an additional donation, even if you have paid or you haven't paid. And sponsoring a lecture or a series and volunteering to help carry out the society's activities. And if you're not a member, please consider joining. It's easy. There are a couple of you said you were thinking about it. I think somebody said they were gonna join soon. So let me explain the difficult procedure that you must navigate in order to join. So if you call up the homepage, www.pswscience.org, you will pull up this. And right up there in the right-hand corner, my goodness, there is a little button that says join. And you push on that button. Blue is a clue. Anything that's blue on a web page means click here and something will happen. In this case, something good happens. It pulls up this page. This page has another blue button, membership application, and some information about membership. It tells you all the splendid benefits that you will receive if you become a member. And you push here, click on this one, and it pulls up, guess what, the membership application form. Now, you do not have to have a high IQ. You do not have to have a PhD in MS or BS. In fact, not even necessary to have graduated from high school. All you really need is a serious interest in science, technology, and engineering. You fill out the membership application form, and when you get to the bottom, you'll see this button. When you press that button, it will pull up the payment page. Do we ask you to pay in advance? In the unlikely event that you change your mind, or we decide that, well, your interest really relates to Hegel, Plato, Aristotle, and Spinoza, and you're probably not gonna be really thrilled to come and hear lectures on tests, we will refund your money. That's very rare, but just so you know, we're not gonna take your money and run. But we ask you to join, and I hope that you do. Remember that PSW is a nonprofit educational organization. It's tax exempt under Section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code until they change it. Contributions are tax deductible to the extent permitted by law and by the Internal Revenue Service. All PSW members in good standing may wear the PSW rosette. It's the blue one, the bigger one, the more important one. If you wish to purchase a PSW rosette, $15 plus tax, you may do so at the rosette table in the back of the auditorium. Cameo? Cameo will help you out with that. Our next lecture will be the 2416th meeting of the society. It will take place here in the Powell Auditorium on November 15th, 2019. The speaker will be Dean Bromish, Distinguished Professor of Oceanography at the Distinguished Smithsonian Institute of Oceanography at the very distinguished University of California, San Diego, of which I am a proud alumnus. And so is our member, Mike Cohen, here in the front row. Dean will be talking about the Global Autonomous Ocean Sensor Flotilla, known as Argo, which is continuously observing the ocean. There are now over 3,600 Argo floats. They are distributed all over the world. They freely float with the currents. And believe it or not, they have GPS, so they know where they are, probably better than we do. They routinely cycle down, every, I think it's every 10 days. They go down to about 2,000 feet. And on the way up, they measure temperature, salinity, and other physical parameters in the ocean. And then when they get to the surface, they broadcast the data back to the various data centers. And they are accumulating a continuous record of ocean physical properties and their dynamics. Um, which is quite unprecedented in human history to know as much as we're learning. So he will be talking about that and talking about improvements to that system and how that system integrates with uh, a number of other observational platforms to give us a more complete picture of 
the oceans and how they interact with the climate and how they affect the climate. On December 6th, we will be having our last lecture of the year, the 2417th lecture, and the speaker will be Harold Hess, who is group leader at Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Genelia Farms. He will be speaking on the brain in super resolution 3D, large volume molecular mapping of brain circuits. Harold is the partner of Eric Betzig, and Eric Betzig won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for this work. Um, the lecture is sponsored by PSW Science team, I'm sorry, PSW member Tim Thomas, who is not here tonight, but we thank him for that. Uh, the rest of the season is like this, and I, Bob, don't publish this yet. <laughs> Give us a chance to get it up on the web. It should be up on the web in a few days. So January 10th, which is when we would ordinarily have the president's lecture, the president's lecture has been rescheduled so we can have a Nobel Prize winning uh, speaker, which would be Malcolm Frank, the inventor of cryo-electron microscopy, and that will be on the 21st of February. The second lecture of the new year, 2020, will be uh, by Ellen Stofan, who is the Adrian Mars Director of the Air and Space Museum right here in DC, and she will be speaking on Venus. Venus is that very hot neighbor of ours, which um, a lot of space scientists, planetary scientists are now looking towards as being maybe informative of the sort of dynamics that lead to a planet being very hot. Let's see who's next. Whoops, sorry. I'm losing track of what I'm doing. Yes, and then we have Jack Gilbert, who is going to be talking on microbiomics, followed by Wacom Frank, mentioned previously. And we have Rajus Rao, Rajes Rao, who will be speaking on brain computer interfaces. He's written a textbook if you're interested. And then on March 20th, we have Henrik Christensen who is uh, at UCSD as well, and he'll be speaking on robotics, and the sponsor of that lecture is our own Erica Kane, who's here in the audience. And then there are a few dates to fill in, and finally, uh, one to mention is on May 15th, Shep Dolman will be speaking. It's not on this, but he is the sort of organizer and PI on the Event Horizon um, Observation Consortium that imaged a black hole not too long ago. And so that should be very interesting. Keep looking at the website. This is going to fill in in the next few weeks. And I can tell you about it at the next lecture. I'd also like to uh, note that PSW is run entirely by volunteers. Nobody's getting paid for any of this, believe it or not. No paid staff at all. And without our dedicated volunteers, we wouldn't be doing any of this. So we want to thank them, especially tonight's crew, so we have Cameo Lance, room manager, who read the minutes, who did the live chats, and who also handled the rosettes. We got Robin Taylor hiding behind the audio racks back there, and she is the live stream director. She did the video setup, and she's going to break it down, and she also does post-production, among a lot of other things. Noah Block, over there on camera one. Brett Magrum, over there on camera two. Our red, blue, and black mic runners. And our post-lecture equipment wrangler, Lloyd Mitchell, who probably doesn't know that he's supposed to be the post-lecture equipment wrangler. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs> so let me note that the social hour ends promptly at 10.30, although we might go a little bit later tonight. And I will now accept a motion for adjournment of the 2,415th meeting of the Society to the Social Hour, Bob Terry, moves, and do we have a second from a member? We have several. All members in favor? All members opposed? Uh, amazingly, the meeting is adjourned unanimously to the social hour. Thank you all for coming.